I'm delighted to welcome uh, Eddie Sahakian here today to uh, one of our series of interviews for UK Cigar Scene. So welcome Eddie. Thank you Nick. And you're part of a, a, um, a, a, a family experience with, uh, with cigars, so I wanted to ask you what your first recollections of cigars were in the, as part of the Sahakian dynasty? Well, as you can imagine, they certainly predate my ability to enjoy a cigar. I would have been a young, uh, in my early, early five, four, five, six year old uh, life, my father was always a keen smoker of cigars and uh, when he was enjoying his cigar, of course, the, the perfume an aroma of the fine cigars, the time it would have been Havana's, was wafting around him and of course around us. Uh, Dad was always a considerate smoker. He wouldn't abuse closed spaces and cigars. However, the time, a fine vehicle, a cigar in that vehicle with your kids was not the end of the world. So I do have very strong memories of driving in the Riviera, in the French Riviera, and Dad wafting his cigar smoking it through, and of course the perfume lingering on my nose. It was beautiful. Lovely, and it, it's interesting, my, my kids today love the smell of a cigar, or if I've been out smoking, love, love that. So it's, uh, yeah, it's interesting, that, that, that memory that it, that it brings, and I have memories of my uncles and grandfather smoking cigars oh, too. very much. So your introduction to the world of cigars was very much through your father. Tell us a little about the, the background to the, uh, the Sahakian dynasty, as I say. Well, uh, Dad always had a passion for cigars. That, that was evident. And I would extend it beyond cigars. He had a passion for fine pipe tobaccos as well. Yeah. And this is certainly in Iran when we were living there. Uh, when he arrived in the UK, and in, this would have been about 78, 1978, uh, he was at a loss what to do in his business life. Uh, he was too young to retire. So the concept of having his own cigar shop where he could enjoy his passion uh, and it was his own business uh, was highly appealing. We were very fortunate that the, the world of Davidoff and, and my own father's interest and opportunity came together in London in, in the late 70s. And after some very interesting conversations, Dad opened the Davidoff store in London in 1980. So it became a business for him and for me being exposed to dad both at a personal level with his passion for cigars but also at a business level and this would entail for example helping out at Christmas, helping boxes, helping wrap from a relatively young age. Uh, we saw the world of cigars and all that comes with that. It was fascinating. And you, when you went into to business as a young man yourself, you didn't start into the family business from, from, from the word go, did you? you you've, you've done other things before you, you joined. That's right, Nick. Yes, sir. Uh, I had a brief moment in the business and, and I was always, uh, let's say, associated with the business because of my holiday work, call it internships. <laughs> Uh, but once I fell into the real world of, uh, of employment, I did a nine-year stint in investment banking. Uh, and after that, came back into the business with Dad. Uh, I'd had the great fortune of working while studying in my early 20s, and this would have been in the early 90s in London. So at that time, it was a very exciting moment in the world of cigars. The, the US boom was taking off, and people from all over, all walks of life were coming to cigars. So I had that as a little aperitif perhaps in my own business life. I then had the main course at some point of, of investment banking, which has its own appeal, mm. but nothing beats the world of cigars. And I had the great fortune of coming back into a business that my father had invested his love, passion, and, and very much his youth growing. So uh, it made it very easy to come back and indulge. Not a hard decision to, to, to join the, the family business? Not at all. Excellent. 
and and you're I, I, we were talking a little earlier I, I think you're probably in a in a unique position because of the, the the Davidoff store and the fact that you sell both Cuban cigars and, and New World cigars to have traveled extensively in both worlds so tell us a little about your, your your travels in the cigar world and where you've been and well, it's been fascinating, Nick. In the context of, of the origin of cigars, uh, you know, certainly Cuba has historically held the most important position for many cigar smokers. But in the last 20 years, and this is in large part thanks to Davidoff's own involvement in Dominican Republic, and more recently Nicaragua, we have seen these two markets develop uh, from strength to strength. Uh, the U.S. market, as you know, is still a, a fundamentally non-Cuban market. So the opportunity for brands to, to develop from Nicaragua, from Dominican Republic, in the U.S. market without serious competition from Cuba has been very important for their germination and development. Um, perhaps 20 years ago, the argument could have been made that non-Cuban cigars left a lot to be desired in the strength and perhaps complexity. Today, they are giving the Cubans a very serious run for their money both in quality but also in the taste and different sensations and strengths that you can source from them. Of course, my own travels extend beyond where the cigars are made. Very recently, I had the, the great fortune of traveling to Cognac as a guest of Rémi Martin to experience the Louis XIII production. And I have to say, it was divine. Uh, Cognac is not a bad place to visit, but in the hands of Rémi Martin, it becomes magical. And of course, the drink itself, the Louis XIII, is a beautiful companion for a fine cigar. Mm. So I'm very blessed to cover some wonderful travel. So it's lovely how the, how the cigar world opens so many interesting doors. Yes, definitely. And the, the artisanal qualities, the, the importance of time and craftsmanship, in the world of fine handmade cigars, mm. extends in many other artisanal products. Yeah. Good wine, whiskies, cognacs, champagne, yeah. uh, and a few others I can, I can certainly bring to mind. But it's also wonderful that other brands like, like that, some drinks brands and the like, aren't sort of terrified of that, uh, of the link to, to, to cigars. Cigars bring something else to, to combined together with, with something like a fine cognac. Oh, very much, Nick. Uh, a cigar is first and foremost a source of enjoyment and self-indulgence. Mm. Uh, it's an instrument of pleasure and the world around that is built to maximize that moment for our consumer. Yeah. So, of course, most luxury products today are about the experience rather than the physical product itself. Mm. Cigars has always been about that. The rest of the luxury world is catching up, in my view, yeah. on the importance of the experience, not just the product yes. in the consumer's yeah. mind. Interesting. And I know we've talked in the past about the, uh, about the, the differences between the, uh, the, the Cuban cigar factories and the, the Davidoff factories in, uh, in the Dominican Republic. That, that bringing that little bit of, uh, of, of Swiss um, accuracy and, uh, and manufacturing to the, to the process of, uh, of, of manufacturing cigars, a little different to, uh, to, to Havana, I guess. Very much. Uh, you know, Nick, it reminds me of the joke people make about, you know, if you had an Italian, a Frenchman, an Englishman, and I think various tasks between cooking, <laughs> making love, <laughs> and perhaps uh, running a country are intermingled. The same principles can be seen in the cigar world. Cuba has undoubtedly have the history and the tradition uh, of doing it beautifully. Mm. Uh, but of course, get a Swiss company to bring in an extraordinary level of quality control and precision yeah. in the way they can do this. Well, perhaps in a dream scenario, you would have the Swiss doing all of that and you would have the world of fine tobaccos available to that company mm. to blend the perfect cigar for the customer. Yeah. Well, I guess that's, that's why in this day and age, the, the, the Cuban Davidoffs are still so treasured by, by the world of, of collectors and by people who, who want to, to uh, the, the, the collectors, the, the someone who wants to be able to say that they've smoked every fine cigar. Cuban, uh, Cuban Davidoffs are still incredibly uh, 
highly rated, aren't they? Very much. Uh, it's arguably one of the most desirable cigars in any collection. You know, the last Cuban Davidoffs were produced in 92. Um, already at that period, people were beginning to collect them. Today, even more so, as in the world of fine wine, mm. anyone who has aspirations and certainly affluence is looking to develop their fine collections of, yeah. of let's say, enjoyable products. Cigars sit right there and, of course, Cuban Davidoffs are right at the heart exactly. of that collection. Okay, so um, moving, moving on a little to the, the development, further development of the Sahakian brand specifically here. I know you've been hugely involved in the, in the development of the, the, the beautiful Edward Sahakian lounge at the, at the Bulgari Hotel. So that's, that's, I think, if I'm right in saying, that's very much your project, isn't it? That's yes, uh, it's true, Nick. Uh, whilst we're using my father's name uh, for the lounge, there is uh, a lot of impetus from me. Less interest from Dad, not because he doesn't love uh, the idea of cigars and, and a fine place to enjoy them, but he is far too modest to, to be heavily promoting his own name. <laughs> And, uh, and that's just what we love in Dad and, and what most of his customers do as well. Mm -hmm. uh, the concept for us was very straightforward. It was really to acknowledge the, the history and, and the fine reputation of my father in the world of cigar merchants mm -hmm. uh, and to, to create an experience for a customer that touches on our own core values that are in my father's DNA. Mm -hmm. They're expressed in the shop on a daily basis we thought that would extend very beautifully to a more f formal hospitality setting, yeah. hence the idea. Yeah, and it's a, it's a beautiful lounge and it, you can see the, the care and the attention to detail that's gone into producing that, that lounge and, and, and the, the staff and the, the events that you run there. It's, uh, thank, it's thank a real you. tribute. Thank you very much. Uh, it, it was very important for us to, to work with a partner that, that sees things the same way, and certainly Bulgari Hotels uh, are that partner. Uh, it helps that we have a wonderful team there. Mike and Attila run it perfectly, even in our absence. Yeah. Uh, and most importantly, my father's name is on the top of the door. It's a reputation that's taken 35 years to, to develop. We are not willing to risk the value of that reputation so we would only work on it in, in the way we thought is correct and, and Bulgari have given us that platform. Excellent. Well, I'm looking forward to at some stage later in this series, I hope, interviewing Mike and talking a little to him about his ethos. But he's a young man who's, who's risen very fast in the world of cigars, isn't he? And, and to, to, to sort of some dizzy heights, really. He's, he's, he works very hard, I know. Very much. You know, Mike is a true asset for our business. He would be for any business. Mm because importantly, he loves cigars. It's a passion for him. When we discussed the opportunity with him, he took all of three seconds to say yes. <laughs> and it wasn't because we offered him sackfuls of money, sadly. Yeah. The truth was he always wanted to be in cigars and we have found the perfect partner. And as you know, Nick, any brand can fall at the customer interface. Yeah. Yeah. If you're lucky to have a good person there, mm then it can only work well for you. If you're unlucky, it can destroy a brand. Yes. Well, in Mike, we have a consummate professional, yeah. a consummate host, yeah. a lover of fine cigars. Yeah, as you say, a man who's passionate about, about the business he's in, and that, that absolutely comes across, and it fits with, uh, with yours and your, your father's ethos too. And the cigars you've got at the Bulgari, I think of them sometimes as a bit, you, you sort of, you fly a little below the radar, I think. I don't think most people actually understand quite what you have there. So, I mean, you've got a beautiful humidor stocked with some wonderful current cigars, but then a very, very special humidor of, of cigars that you've been and your father have been aging for, for a long time. Let's talk a little about that and some of those, those cigars. With pleasure, Nick. Uh, it's a very important point for us. Uh, when we thought about the, the lounge and what we were going to offer the customer to enjoy there in the what we call old, rare or vintage selections, my father, as you know, is a cigar collector. So to get him to part with one of his treasured collectibles is near on impossible. Yeah. The only way I could do it was to say, Dad, 
your name is on the lounge, it's on the shop in the Bulgari, yeah. let us showcase some of your delightful collection. Mm. So the cigars were hand selected from our very own stock. It was important that we do not dilute the curation and provenance of the stock there. Like very, very fine wines, if cigars are not aged correctly, if they're not loved throughout their 20, sometimes 30 year life mm. before they reach the customer's lips, yeah. they are as good as hot air. Yeah. Yeah. So only from our own collection, only stored to the exacting conditions that my father implemented in the early 80s, yeah. uh, which we can touch on as well. Um, and of course, the gems from that collection. So we've got some very fine Cuban Davidoffs. We have some rarities from the Cuban limited edition and uh, rare humidor selections. Uh, and we have what we hope is, uh, is an enticing selection for the adventurous <laughs> smoker. Oh, I know it's an enticing, uh, an enticing collection. T tell us a little about your specific way of aging cigars at, at Davidoff, because again, I don't think, uh, I know I've been lucky enough to, to, to see your, your storage facility and, and the way you work, but I don't think most people understand what you do and the fact that it is different to, 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 to anything else I've come across. Uh, Nick, this was entirely my father's uh, contemplation and creation. Uh, in the early 80s, we certainly implemented humidity, which was a development of Zeno Davidoff. However, we also, at the time, had problems with weevils coming from Cuba. And our ingenious approach was to bring the ambient temperature in our long-term storage substantially lower than normal. So we were targeting 10, 11 centigrade. Right. We also found that a slightly lower humidity perhaps in the high 60s versus a flat 70 or even above, mm. worked much better for just stopping any weevils from elaborating or manifesting in the tobacco. Yeah. We discovered in later years that it had the unintended but beneficial consequence of slowing and graduating the aging and the impact on the micro-fermentation right. of all these cigars. So 20 years later, get a cigar from our collection that's been kept with us for that period of time, yeah. we find it smokes as a much younger cigar than the equivalent cigar from a normal temperature, normal humidor environment. Right, right. And we t I know we've, we've touched before and we've talked about this with yourself and your father, and you've talked about the, the way you decide what it, what it is that you actually put down there and what you store. Let, let, talk a little about that and how, how that, uh, that works. Well, we have two approaches. The first, of course, is in limited and rare editions. When they arrive and we smoke them, if we decide it has all the fundamental characteristics of a future champion, yeah. and that would have to be, of course, its structure, its flavor, the blend profile, Indeed, the physical attributes of the cigar as well, mm. it has to be a beautiful cigar, well-constructed. Yeah. If all those things are present, then the select few get set aside right. and put away for our long-term aging program. It sounds quite daunting, but in fact, it's a pleasure. The only sacrifice we make is that we can't enjoy the cigars there and then. Right but it's well worth the wait in all Pleasure cases. Pleasure deferred. Definitely. <laughs> uh, well, and the, and the, uh, the proof of the pudding is, in the, is just in looking at and, and tasting those, those cigars. And I know you've talked about cigars that have gone through that aging process that maybe, um, uh, maybe have gone off or maybe aren't as good as they were but then have come back actually within that that that, that aging so it's quite an interesting process most certainly we are continuing to learn you know 25 30 years into our aging program mm. uh, you know very recently i'll give you a couple of brief examples we saw some davidoff number ones this is the long ligita number one size the lancero size that perhaps six seven years ago were tasting rather flat and these would have been about 20 years old at that stage. However, in the last three, four years, we have seen them come back both in strength 
and flavor profile the very same cigars. To see that re-establishment of flavor and strength, we had never experienced before. Right. We've also seen a recent phenomenon where cigars packaged either in cellophane or in single tubes, thereby retarding its exposure to air and therefore the continued fermentation, in the short term would have been considered a negative for the aging of cigars. Yeah. 25, 30 years later, those cigars are smoking with fantastic flavor for the simple reason that we have almost frozen them in time. Yeah. Yeah. So had you asked me 15 years ago, would you age cellophane and tube cigars? I would have probably said no. Mm. By accident we have, and yeah. thank God we have. They are beautiful. Yeah, that's interesting because we, we did a, a, a piece on uh, some of the, the Millennium Jars and one of the collectors I spoke to talk about, spoke about the, the difference between the jar once it had been opened and ex exposed to air and the, sealed, the original sealed jar and how the sealed jar was, uh, had, had tasted like, even though it's a 14-year-old you know, cigar, uh, tasting one from an unsealed jar, or a jar that had just been unsealed, tasted like a very fresh fresh cigar, so yes, very uh, interesting. So interesting. we are learning. Yeah, well, yeah, it's, uh, it's not really an exact science, is it? You have to learn and, and, and change. And the, as I say, I don't think most people appreciate the, the, the technology that you use and how that, uh, and, and they have the, the delight of being able to go to the Bulgari and, and, uh, and taste and understand the, the benefits of uh, well, the technology you add, use. Nick, uh, my father and I have a secret weapon, which is this very large Armenian nose. <laughs> <laughs> Perhaps with these, we're able to identify the future winners as well. Oh, brilliant. Now, something that people will, um, will spy if they walk past your, the beautiful store on the, uh, on the corner of German Street and St. James's, that's a little different from other cigar stores, is a collection in the window, often a collection of uh, beautiful cigar box guitars. Tell me a little about, uh, about that, because that's a little different. Well, for me, it brings together two of my passions, cigars and music. Uh, sadly, I never had the talent to, to play an instrument well, but I certainly loved it enough to, to, to be passionate about well-played music. About three years ago, uh, a very lovely gentleman walked in by the name of G-Man Hawkins. In fact, his name is Jeff, but we refer to him as G-Man, asking to buy some empty cigar boxes. I asked him what it was for. He mentioned that he, as a hobby, was making cigar box guitars. I was fascinated and I gave him one condition, said you can have the boxes with my compliments, but allow me the honor of selling them if he wants to sell them. And this is where the relationship began. Jeff has been creating works of art ever since. We have sold countless cigar box guitars. Each one is unique. Each one has its own sound. Each one has its own character. And of course, you played with a slide, but in a very simple way. So even if you're not a virtuoso guitarist, yeah. myself included, you can play it very quickly and very easily. Uh, and you can recapture, if not the, the mood of the, of the blues players in the 1920s and 1930s, yeah. certainly the sound. Yeah, yeah. And they're, they're beautiful things. They really are beautiful things. And we've got a lovely uh, interview I've done with, with Jeff and, and some video of him playing, which. Uh, which we'll be uh, uh, publishing shortly. So uh, yeah, he's a, he's a great guy, really great guy. Okay, let's let's move on now to uh, to the final three questions that we use to uh, to close out every every interview. Um, tell me first of all, first question: your the favourite place to uh, to smoke a cigar. Oh, that's a that's a good question, Nick. I would normally say wherever there is a comfortable chair and a good companion is my favorite place to enjoy a cigar but of course there are a few notable exemptions and i have to say historically the favorite place i've ever smoked a cigar was sitting in the back of the hotel national on my first trip to cuba in 1996 with my father and desmond salter enjoying a fine cigar for me it was the companionship and the whole romance of that trip that made it the most special place to enjoy a cigar. Excellent. And often, 
we enjoy a, a, a small uh, libation, a small drink with a cigar. What, what's your favourite uh, drink to, uh, to enjoy with a cigar? Again, I have several, but my palate certainly extends to the sweeter side, the complementary spirits that work with the flavours, the smokiness and perhaps a little bit the peatiness and earthiness of a cigar. Good examples for me are a sweet single grain whiskey, a fine Speyside perhaps, a good port wine, an exceptional brandy, but with the caveat that it should not be an overwhelming brandy, but a more subtle brandy. And more recently, Sautern. It's a delightful combination for a cigar. I shall go away and try that. <laughs> we'll I look forward to that. Don't forget me, Nick, when you do that. <laughs> and the final question. Um, tell us about the finest cigar that you've ever enjoyed that you smoked. Again, there's a few candidates in my memory banks for, for that experience, but I would narrow it down to a single Davidoff Dom Perignon cigar which I had the great honor and pleasure to experience in my early 20s. My father, of course, was my companion in that enjoyment. He sat me down in the shop and he had a, a ritual of smoking one Dom Perignon cigar on the anniversary of each year of the opening of the cigar shop. So he had that box given to him by Zeno Davidoff himself. And he had a few of the Dom Perignon left and he sat down and he took one out and then he took another out and offered it to me. I was already a cigar geek at that stage, so the, the impact of what I was smoking was not lost on me, but I'm pleased to say the flavor, the taste, and the whole experience was the best I've ever had. Wonderful. Well, that's a, and that's a great cigar to have at the top of your list, so thank you. too. Eddie, it's been an absolute pleasure um, thank you so much uh, for, uh, for joining us today and uh, thank you very much. A wonderful interview. Really appreciate Nick, it. Nick, the pleasure has been all mine. I wish you the greatest success with the project. Thank you and very much. And after all that talk of a cigar, what can I do but start <laughs> my cigar? <laughs> Excellent. Eddie, thank you very much indeed. My pleasure, Nick.